actually a financial analyst for Computer Science Corporation. This is a, just a handheld for presentation. Uh, I also serve as a tax enforcement officer and served quite a long time in the military, which is why I can attend St. Edwards, because they pay for it. So, uh, I'm a graduate student. Uh, my master's is in accountancy, which I graduated in the fall. My name is Benjamin Stockard. I'm currently pursuing a master's in accountancy and an MBA with concentration in finance, and I currently work as a photographer. And my name is Mara Maya, and I am a master's of accounting student. And uh, for the past couple of years, I've worked with the city of Boston as a governmental accountant. Uh, recently, I was promoted into a program working this position. I hold a bachelor's in IT and bachelor's in accounting. Now, the, uh, the royal gentleman and ladies will take um, will be the Commissioner, Commissioner Goodell of the NFL, also the Traumatic Brain Injury Council, uh, which is a subsidiary of the NFL, and uh, honored guests and members, which would include managers and coaches that could make it to the event. Yes, uh, we are the Holy Cross Consulting Company. My name is Brandon Prey. I am a former tax enforcement officer. I have significant experience in tax litigation. I also have worked as a financial analyst for CSC, so I understand the implications of different actions and how it impacts the financials. Ben. My name is Benjamin Stockard. I hold a degree in radio, television, film, and I'm a media expert and have experience in usability studies. And my name is Maura Bayan, and I have extensive experience in um, financial reporting for the governmental agencies. I have also been involved with researching how tax laws and other laws and regulations affect the financial reporting for municipal entities. And I have also prepared uh, statistical sections of the comprehensive and financial report. And now I'll hand it back to Brandon who will explain to you the statement of the law. Now, gentlemen, the commissioner hired us as a third party non-affiliated group to evaluate what is going on with the NFL and traumatic brain injury. We were hired to assist in developing a strategic plan to educate and help prevent further traumatic brain injury from really from the NFL. One of the underlying issues that we have discovered during our research, the NFL has a strong conflict of interest in how it does its research, how it discloses the information, and how it pushes that out there to the public and to the players. NFL currently is big business. Uh, revenues are nine billion annually, with profits of one billion in 32 markets across the United States and in Europe. Uh, as such a big organization, the NFL is a standard setter for all sports, down to high school and even pee wee football. Traumatic brain injury is not just the problem of the NFL. This is a cross-sport, cross-industry issue. In fact, in the early 2000s. We knew what traumatic brain injury was, but we didn't actually know the effects. It was because of the Iraq and Afghanistan war that we really truly started to understand how traumatic brain injury occurred, how it happened, what type of impacts caused this. So this is not just an NFL problem. This goes the entire spectrum for society that is involved in any type of interactive sport, from military to peewee football. actually the result of trauma that causes damage to the brain. Um, in football, players sustain a traumatic brain injury as a result of a concussion. Um, as you can see in the diagram, you know this is a perfectly healthy brain in a CT scan. When players tackle each other in the field or when they fall or when they hit objects such as a goalpost, they sustain an injury and that forces or causes trauma to the brain and the brain uh, actually uh, moves inside of their skull and the impact on the opposite side of the uh, where they sustain the injury actually causes them to sustain a traumatic brain injury such as a concussion. Um, and as you can see, they sustain damage. Uh, say uh, they are then taken off the field, and a team medic analyzes them and looks for signs or symptoms that are associated with a traumatic brain injury. Uh, some of the symptoms that they look for are actually um, assess. They do an assessment of. Uh, balance, orientation, um, if they have lost consciousness, if they have headaches. And uh, many of these, of these many occasions, uh, they cannot um, determine whether they have suffered a concussion because some of these symptoms are actually delayed. 
um, they can be delayed uh, hours, weeks, months, and even years. And if not treated properly, um, they can result in long-term uh, damage to the brain. The image you see to the upper right is when a concussion occurs. So that white blurb right there, that's what happens when your head impacts another object. The bottom part, that's what happens when you don't receive proper treatment, when you don't get rest. The brain can usually recoup, but when you get right back into the game, that black spot is literally part of your brain missing. And with each concussion, it gets worse. And then on the left here is a healthy brain. Notice no dark spots. And of course, the Center of Disease Control um, has statistics in their website, and they have um, they attribute that most of the traumatic, the most of the causes, leading causes of traumatic brain injury are a result of falls. Uh, whenever they have suffered a, or struck by or against, or even including um, traffic accidents, assaults, and other ways that you can sustain a traumatic brain injury. Um, this is also a statistic associated with children. There are over 70,000 concussions suffered in children in just youth football. And that alone is just youth football. That's not including children under the age of 14, which are most susceptible to traumatic brain injuries. Um, of course, you know, some of these symptoms are not easily recognized when you sustain an injury, and a lot of these injuries remain undiagnosed. And of course, they suffer effects for, uh, in the long term, such as, um, such as, uh, Cognitive dysfunction, anxiety disorders, uh, severe headaches, uh, seeing bright lights, and even some links to suicide. Not only that, prolonged damage to the brain causes the exact same symptoms as Alzheimer's disease. This is what many of former football players are suffering. Legally, right now, gentlemen, you have 2,400 individual lawsuits involving over 3,600 players. These lawsuits derive around fraud allegations. The individuals in these suits are stating that the NFL fraudulently hid information and had the intent to hide that from the players to avoid these future costs that would be associated. The second aspect of it is negligence. Because these players are saying that the NFL failed to act proactively against the risk that they had already known about, but they were acting in negligence. Now, in the defense of the NFL, the players do have the assumption of risk. They did sign on for an extremely violent sport. They knew that these injuries were highly likely, and there was always known that there could be a risk of permanent disabilitating injuries. For the players, they had that concept of superior knowledge that the NFL knew something and withheld it from them. As an example of what a cost of a negligence lawsuit regarding traumatic brain injury could be, 2009, your helmet manufacturer who owns your contract, Riddell, lost a lawsuit to a single person for $3.1 million. This was not caused by faulty equipment. This was caused strictly because they failed to put warnings what traumatic brain injury was. Finally, you have the court of public opinion. What the public believes you did and how you acted is exactly how your court cases are gonna turn out. If the public believes that you are acting in a good manner, doing what is best for your players to be proactive at preventing and educating this, these court cases can go for your way. If, however, they feel that you are in fact not acting proactively and not covering this topic significantly, these court cases can go against you. As it only takes one court case for everything to go wrong. Think of tobacco. One, one court case is one and suddenly hundreds more will follow. Now, we have derived a basic estimate of some of the litigation costs that you might be incurred. This is a cost of legal, including the losses for lawsuits, the attorney fees, and this. We took these average estimates from Fox News analysts, Business Sports Daily analysts, and ESPN analysts. Worst case scenario, when you average these guys, are saying $1.7 billion that you could potentially lose in this litigation. Out of that $1.7 billion, a portion of that would be a yearly reoccurring fee that's gonna affect your cash flow. Your best case scenario is what you guys have already agreed to do, and that is a yearly increase of $264 million to the pension benefits and to medical, medical supplements to players who have received traumatic brain injury. 
most probable. We took basically a portion of litigation that could go wrong based on the Riddell negligence lawsuit. We combine that with your yearly occurring average of increased pensions, and you're looking at $750 million divided amongst your 32 teams. The impact to your cash flows for a business in a public perspective, with this increased pension, this is taking the cash flow from your businesses. The individual leagues only average 20 to $30 million of revenue, actual net profit a year. They may make revenues of a billion, but they only actually bring in 20 to 30 million. That could be a big, big impact. Your medical costs increase, your insurance through Transamerica. These guys only allot $30,000 a year in medical coverage to your former players and current players. The average cost for treatment of a traumatic brain injury, $90,000. 2,400 players to 3,600 players at a $60,000 difference. You can do the math. That is a massive impact to your cash flows if you don't start preventing this. Again, the court of public opinion uh, arises. Our own president has even said if he had two daughters, uh, so if he had two daughters, he had two sons, he probably would not let them play football. I personally have a son. I don't want him to play football if there are these risks. Um, if he goes and he becomes a basketball fan instead, he's going to follow basketball. NFL starts losing, losing viewerships, and this affects the bottom line years down the road. I mean, this also affects the parents, and especially the mothers of young children who would think twice before letting their children play football because they don't want their children to hurt. The last aspect of this, your bargaining rights, your bargaining power, your influence over the NFL Players Union. When the public is on your side, people don't feel the need that NFL players should be compensated more. But when the public feels that if there is a situation that you have been negligent towards your players, they gain the upper hand in bargaining, which will further increase your yearly pension costs and possibly increase your medical costs. Uh, now on the ethical dimension, the NFL sets the precedent as the leader. Uh, several other leagues, such as collegiate leagues, high school football, down to Pee Wee, uh, Canadian League, they all depend and do what the NFL does. If the NFL sets the standards, and if, if y'all are the leaders in tackling this problem, it'll trickle down to the Pee Wee Leagues. Uh, the appearance of conflicts of interest. Uh, a lot of these studies are conducted by the NFL. You need to eliminate these conflicts of interest and have independently reviewed studies and peer-reviewed studies uh, Again, superior knowledge. Uh, if any information gets out that the NFL had superior knowledge of this, it's going to be a PR nightmare. Uh, the labeling of mild TBI. First off, it's traumatic brain injury. TBI mitigates this effect. Uh, although a medical term mild, there is no such form as a mild case of brain injury. I mean, these symptoms are very severe. It's like calling it mild cancer. Societal impact. This goes down to society. I mean, kids are suffering from traumatic brain injury. It affects all societies up to football, college, and there's this also uh, a warrior culture that's being implemented. When someone gets knocked down and is hurt, it's get back up, pat them on the back, you're tough, you can do this. Uh, instead of that, we need to, the NFL needs to change this culture and say, okay, let's make sure you're okay, let's get you checked out and play a safer game. And the reason, it is a societal impact. Everybody follows how your players act, how you act, how you guys lead this organization. They follow you. So in essence, the way you treat your players and how you do this impacts a whole genre of people. Uh, the stakeholders, we have represented stakeholders. These include NFL players, managers, coaches, they all depend on the NFL financially. Uh, NFL and team owners, uh, manufacturers both of equipment and anything that has the NFL logo. Uh, you'll license that out for bags, shirts, a number of products. Uh, the networks and the advertisers. A lot of networks, they use the NFL to promote shows and there's big money in advertising, so they're going to care. Your non-represented stakeholders, of course, are players of all ages, especially children and your current players. Uh, schools and junior leagues. Some schools have even canceled their football programs because they fear this danger and they don't want the liability of it. Um, and coaches lose their jobs. Uh, families and the youth. This is both of NFL players and also families and youth of children affected. Um, it spans more than just the injured. 
and then communities. Uh, municipalities, they rely on tax revenues, uh, usually in the form of the hotel tax brought in for people to watch the games. If less people are interested in football, municipalities stand to lose. They also hold bonds uh, that they issue to help build stadiums, so they need to make sure that uh, the NFL is able to pay these. Now we're gonna discuss possible solutions. Uh, stricter penalties. Currently, the helmet rule is if you use your helmet as a, what they call spearing, which is impacting to uh, do harm onto somebody else, it's a 15 yard penalty if it occurred outside of the tackle box. Uh, we would like stricter penalties, maybe even suspensions from games if players are intentionally using their helmets to inflict pain and injury. Uh, tougher helmet, helmet standards. Actually, currently the NFL can choose from a variety of rated helmets. We'd like uh, tougher standards for these helmets and only the top rated helmets to be chosen. Another option is to standardize helmets. Instead of giving them a choice, just say this is the highest approved helmet and this is going to be the NFL helmet. Uh, promote safety standards. Uh, this includes when someone gets a concussion, have doctors actually go on the field, analyze them, and do not let them back in the game until they have completed a complete checklist of whether or not a concussion has occurred. Uh, Relabel mild TBI, as we discussed earlier. It's uh, a medical term, but it downplays the issue. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Brandon for opt out disability annuity. Commissioner, as you know, you guys already offer disability annuity for the players to take place in, in the event they are injured or later suffer deals. However, they specifically have to opt in for it. This solution would be to change that to an opt out, force them to opt out and sign that you do not want this option. What this would do is, between the time it takes to get approved from disability, from the start of the package to the end of the package for the disability process for the NFL, this would allow them to have that supplementary income and additional money for medical treatments. Ben? Uh, did, uh, additionally, uh, additional disclosures. Uh, yes, people realize that football is a tough sport, but they don't realize that the helmet doesn't mean that you're free from getting t uh, traumatic brain injury. The helmet just helps protect against it. You still can suffer traumatic brain injury. Uh, increased transparency. This is in the studies that the NFL conducts. If they are peer reviewed, let the public know what you're doing. Be proactive about it. Let them see that you are taking a stance. Uh, increased education. This occurs uh, mainly at the lower level where coaches don't know how to properly teach children how to hit. You want to keep your head up in a hit instead of a head down and uh, also promote how to recognize concussions when they occur on the field. And again, independent reviews. The reviews need to be independent. The NFL needs to separate itself from these reviews. And, and also when increasing education, we want to teach children to look for specific signs and sy symptoms that they could suffer in case they suffer a concussion or a traumatic brain injury. Uh, not everybody knows what signs to look for, and it's important to educate them to look for these signs, especially because they take so long sometimes to appear or to in order to uh, for them to suffer them. So it's important to educate them as well to look for them. The Heads Up and NFL Youth Program. What you've already done is commendable. You already have this in place. However, expansion of this program is a possibility. And by expanding this, not only are you teaching coaches of smaller leagues and your own coaches additional information, you are teaching youths how to know, how to play, and you're teaching the on-field people for your non-represented how to diagnose and understand when a player has received a concussion. And finally, one of the other possible solutions is changing the cultural mentality of the NFL. It is a warrior culture. It is a culture that says, when I get knocked down, I'm getting back up. I'm walking it off. That is a slow cultural change. That takes time, but it is an option that could reduce the overall impact of traumatic brain injury. Now, when we came up with our recommendations and we evaluated the possibilities, this is what we use, and these are who we thought of when we came up with these ideas. Scotty Evelyn, age 17, he's permanently disabled. He received a head injury while playing high school football in 2007 wearing NFL approved gear. Junior Seo, nearly 20 years with the NFL, he committed suicide. On later diagnosis, they determined he had CDT and traumatic brain injury. David Summer, age 10, he died playing football in a youth league in 2009 in Simi Valley, California. Recommendation, gentlemen, do independent reviews and research. This is essential. This removes that conflict of interest. This shows people that you are allowing independent review, that you are disclosing what you know about this. Relabel traumatic brain injury. You call it mild TBI. Mild downplays the severity. 
traumatic brain injury is a serious thing. Develop a supplementary helmet rating system. Take the lead, allow your players to choose, but you set the standard on what is good enough, not allowing an independent association to do it. Take that initiative to allow additional standards. Enforce the highest safety standards. That means when a player spears their head into somebody, a $50,000 fine isn't good enough. These guys made millions. But penalizing them and taking them off the field, striking them from a game, that is the message you need to send. So they know it is not right. Require an independent medical release for your players that have been knocked unconscious or determined to have received an injury on the field that relates to a concussion. After the game, they can review an independent physician with their insurance and get a release that says he is good to go or not good to go. Right now, it is your own paid physicians who say yay or nay, and they are paid by the owners to represent the owners and not the players. Educate. Educate everybody, all your stakeholders. You have the system in place, now utilize it. This is essential, not just for the NFL. You're not just teaching your players about traumatic brain injury. You're teaching the families about traumatic brain injury. You're teaching military guys about traumatic brain injury. You're teaching entire society about it. And you already have the network there. You just have to utilize it. Expand your heads up program. This is probably one of the most commendable things the NFL has done today. This program tries to teach kids, tries to teach coaches what the best thing to do is. Your online site is pretty and it has decent information. But to go to these programs, it's a long flight for most places. They can't afford it. You have 32 teams. Each of these teams have sites. Right now you hold it in New England. You could hold these events at multiple sites with your professional trainers, with your individuals to allow kids, to allow coaches to come in and learn about how to play properly and how to diagnose this injury to keep it from happening. And promoting a culture. This is probably the hardest thing you're gonna come into, promoting new culture, and I know everything about this. I served in the Marines, and our culture was a warrior culture. Changing that mentality takes time. This is a small step process. It starts at the top. Gentlemen, ladies, you have to promote this to your players. You have to make them understand it's okay if you get injured. If you get injured and you seek help, you prolong your career. If you prolong your career, you prolong your life. And if the players do it, high school students will follow, college students will follow, and they'll understand that it's not about getting back in the game and playing, it's about making sure you can continue playing for a longer career. Lead. That's what the NFL does. You are the powerhouse. You are everything here. In the United States, you are the most powerful sporting organization we've ever seen. You are the most profitable organization. You have the ability to lead an entire industry in a proactive nature to change how we think and how we act in a sport and how to diagnose these instances. You can take that lead and change the aspect of people's lives. You can change your mentality on what an injury is, how to treat a head injury, and that it's okay to do it. Conclusion. Everything about these decisions we recommend are going to aid you in all of these aspects. Legally, if you're proactive and you do the right thing, you can prevent future litigation from having a foothold against you. By doing the right thing, not only do you help reduce your future litigation costs, financial aspects, you can reduce your pensions. Well, say that it shouldn't have to increase. You can reduce the costs, costs of future players being injured. That is very expensive. That will keep your cash flows from being reduced. By doing the right thing, you maintain that share of people. You build your followers. And by then seeing you taking the lead, you and yourself become an innovator. Not just a leader, you become an innovator. Currently the NFL talks the talk. They need to walk the walk. It's just a PR facade. Y'all are doing the bare minimum to show that y'all are addressing the topic. Uh, you need to minimize the link between, currently y'all are minimizing the link between concussions and traumatic brain injury. If y'all are proactive, it'll actually help in the long run financially, and your bottom line will be affected posit positively. And remember, it's traumatic brain injury. This is a very 
very serious situation. It doesn't just affect you, it affects everybody. It affects all, all the society that follows the NFL. It affects people who aren't even affiliated with the NFL. You do the research already. You put the information out there. Now actually enforce it. Lead the way. Money-wise, this is, this, is this is not even a dent in your pocket. You will make more money by being proactive than reacting to incidences when they happen. You don't just have a responsibility to your players. You don't have just a responsibility to your owners. You have a responsibility to all those fans who follow what you do and how you act. You can change the entire culture across the board of the sporting industry and be seen as the leading entity for innovation and cultural change within the sports. And most importantly, you have an obligation to these children that are playing and mimicking your players. Uh, they're your future players, your future employers, they're your future fans, and they're just our future. You know, take a proactive instead of reactive approach. And this will bring families together and actually pro uh, make the NFL, you know, have a better, or have a better image in society. Gentlemen and ladies, we do appreciate your time. I know uh, your time is very valuable. We hope you take into consideration what we've, what we've offered. Financially, this isn't a major change for you, but the future, it will heavily impact your cash flows. If you guys have any questions, we will be here. Please feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Commissioner Goodell 
since he came in in 2006, has made amazing progress and steps towards this. But we've got to, but you as the NFL have to push that boundary and push past reacting to being proactive and taking care of it before it happens. Let me ask a question. You know, I, I'm concerned as commissioner and part of this board that we talk a lot about taking the proactive steps to get out in front of this. And I agree wholeheartedly. But one of my biggest concerns is how do we, what do you recommend in terms of us taking a proactive step to what's a situation that's reactive? Because the NFL has been in existence for some years. Since we the 1900s have, edition. We, we have an alumni of players out there who I'm really concerned about now because we're talking about what we do going forward but uh, one of my major concerns, and this board's major concern, is what do we do and how can we go about measuring the impact that this has had on our alumni players? On your alumni players, right now you have taken a step and you've increased the disability pensions. Some of the things you can do for your former players is to expand that medical evaluation. You've done a good job so far. However, your medical evaluation to determine if your former players have traumatic brain injury was designed by two of your council members from the TBIC and paid by the NFL charities to develop the system. The system has yet to be independently reviewed. Get that out there, get it reviewed to make sure that we, you guys are properly checking these former players. The system is long, it's hard, but you can take care of them and you can win these litigations against it by being proactive. When an NFL player comes to the NFL, or when a player comes to be a member of the NFL, they essentially sign a contract to be assaulted, to be battered. It's assault and battery out there on that playing field. Absolutely right. They have gone through an entire history of being assaulted and battered, from peewee football to grade school to high school to college. They're already coming to the NFL as damaged, brain damaged individuals, starting from there. The lawsuits that you've indicated say that they are for fraud and for negligence, for failing to be proactive on our part. What duty and responsibility do we have under the law to be proactive to avoid this negligence? Being proactive and the law are two separate things. You do have a duty to disclose what you know about traumatic brain injury to the players. That's what the negligence is about. They're claiming you knew about it, but you didn't tell them. Now, by openly disclosing this information to players upon enlistment, continuing their education on it, they have a better understanding of the actual risks they are taking. Most of these gentlemen, although adults, are young men when they enlist. It's just like the military. You know you're getting into a risk when you list that contract, but they tell you what you're in for. If the NFL tells them what they're in for and reminds them what they're in for, it doesn't cost you a dime, but you're covering yourself and you're allowing them to have a good understanding of what they're really doing and what they're really risking. I think what my colleague is talking about is more along the lines of the slippery slope concept of ethics. I mean, we are leaders, I understood. But it begins a lot further back down the line. And when the kids are coming up, who's responsible for putting a child at age eight into a tackle football program? It is not the NFL. It is not even our TV shows showing the NFL. It is the parents and the coaches who then do that. And as they come along, if they get a traumatic brain injury or the beginnings of one, because these stack, these come up over time. I mean, if you look at boxing, you look at hockey, you look at other heavy contact sports, and there's plenty of information out there that concussions stack upon each other. And, you know, the problem has to do with what is our organizational ethical responsibility to correct previous woes proactively. It's called corporate social responsibility. Although they are not directly your players, they do watch your players, and they do what your players do. They idolize these guys. When they 
see your players out there not being penalized and doing these activities, the young guys are going to follow. But the NFL understands this, and you gentlemen know what some of the injuries are occurred. Socially, you as an entity can take that step forward and help the lower parts of these younger kids and these families that don't understand what they're getting into and teach them how to handle it. You already do this to an extent. You're just extending the program. And not many parents might understand the severity of traumatic brain injury. The NFL terms it as mild, and they could think, oh, it's just gonna, they're gonna suffer a mild traumatic brain injury, and they're gonna downplay it. And in reality, it can't, you know, a hit is not always gonna be the same. They, depending on the child, if they get hit, you know, the force of the trauma can cause it to be a severe traumatic brain injury. So just relabeling it and not calling it mild, instead calling it what it is, traumatic brain injury. And from, from a marketing standpoint alone, the NFL wants to ensure that this game is safe to play and that it doesn't have this warrior culture and that people actually like the game and aren't repulsed by the fact that people are getting injured. You'll lose support for the game and then you'll end up losing revenue if you start losing viewers. Well, let's just take one example. Uh, your solutions, suggestions, independent medical review, combining that with the risk factor of superior knowledge so we admit that we know more about what's going on here, and therefore when there's a discussion on the field, we're going to require independent medical review before we put the player back in play. We actually have to do that immediately because we do know from superior knowledge that somebody who's tackled on one play, gets a concussion, goes out, sits in the sidelines, may be okay, may be feeling all right. Team doctors may say they're okay, and they put them back in the game, and the very next hit could kill them. All right. If we were to do the opposite and take them out of the game entirely, we might as well change our name to the NFL, National Flag Football League, because we're not going to be having players tackled. Well, we're not necessarily recommending that just because a player gets tackled, you're moving from the great game. We're really more focused on what you already do with the Madden. When a player gets knocked unconscious on the field, you force them off the field anyways. You take them to the locker room. You make them sit down. You have them viewed. If the on-field physician feels they're okay, they go back into the game. But that's not an independent review. That's the on-field physician. What we are recommending is that after that game, if that person had been flagged for concussion, whether they're released back into the game or not, they should go and actually have an independent review from a physician to ensure that, yes, it was a minor concussion, or no, they didn't receive a concussion. Right. It's a simple process. It wouldn't necessarily affect the game any more than what you do, but it does ensure that after the game is over, these guys can get medical attention, and if it really is serious, they can have the necessary break to ensure that their brain is not in a liquid state where it can receive further damage. And that way, not only are you going to extend that player's life, because the average life right now for your players is three years. They make it three years in the game and are usually out because of a disability, they're cut, or they just can't play anymore. This can extend the potential career of these players. And the better they are mentally and cognitively, the better it is for you, because they can act quicker on the field, be smarter on the field, and you can maintain a, a healthier team status. My concerns, and I know it's a slippery slope issue that my colleague has spoken of, is that this is something, this whole traumatic brain injury thing could have been building over time. And where do we, as the leaders of this industry, come into play and say, Maybe there's a point in time where we want to close the door and tell certain guys, no, you can't play the NFL. Actually, you've already done that. The NFL now has increased the recruiting policies for previous players. If these players fail to disclose medical information that they had received from major concussions and been sidelined or hospitalized pre-NFL, they are not allowed to enlist. In fact, you can cut their contract if they lied about it. This is a new standard. Commissioner, uh, your, your council members actually recently just passed this. So you do take this step for people before they have received concussions, because by accepting them in, just like the military, you're adopting that previous injury if you knew about it. Now, where do you find the cutoff to traumatic brain injury? Let's face it, it's been going on since 1900. President Roosevelt had to step in and save the NFL because too many people were dying. Now, the thing is, 
we know it's going to happen. But what can you do about it is for these current players, that's going to affect your future cash flows and how you guys can image yourself publicly and send that message out. Because you can keep these players healthier longer and keep them out there. You can't take away the fact that someone is going to ram their head into a 300-pound linebacker and get knocked unconscious. That's part of the game. But what's not part of the game right now is keeping, is taking those people off, making sure they're medically safe, and keeping them that way. Traumatic brain injury doesn't come from just one concussion, two concussion. We don't really 100% know, but we know with proper rest after one of these injuries are received, that you can significantly reduce the long-term impacts, which benefits the NFL, because you're not going to be spending more money later on medically keeping these guys up, sending them to centers to get their balance tested, sending them to centers to have neurological surgery. That's expensive, but you can keep that and limit the long-term effects by taking those appropriate actions. I guess the avenue I was going down is requiring maybe some sort of examination or whatever. You know, if players got a bad heart, you know, they, they examine them and it's no go until you get that fixed up. You know, they, they have to go through all kinds of physical examinations yes. prior to entering the league. And I guess what I'm looking to hear is what do you suggest to us as the leaders in terms of the mental damage that may be done? Now, Mora actually knows a lot about the TBI testing and how you can determine if a person has. I also have experience because I've been tested for it. Mora, would you like to explain what, well, how they I mean, can test? Not all players are going to suffer effects of traumatic brain injury. So, I'm talking about the enlisted players. Well, when they enlist the players, I mean, I assume I um, you had mentioned the tests earlier to us, the uh, eye test, ear test. Well, they do assessments in the field when they suffer concussions, but I don't know about it when they enlist. One way you can do it, and the VA actually does this, I've gone through this test several times, I served in the military, as I told you all, I received a spine injury, and I've been tested for TBI almost every six months. The way you can test somebody to see if they actually have a traumatic brain injury and the symptoms of it is cognitive tests. It's, it's basically a reading test. You're actually seeing how they respond to verbal language, if they can respond in, in, a, in an efficient manner. You're testing their balance. This is the best way to tell if somebody has a super brain injury. It's called the floating board test. It's a little machine which uh, you use in physical therapy, but it allows a person to have to try to balance on one leg on a floating board with two supports. If you have received brain injury that is common with the TBI symptoms, you actually have the inability to not be able to do this. It's a great test to determine if somebody had received a brain injury before. Now, is this soundproof? No, you could have somebody that did receive a brain injury and you won't know for 20 years, but you can weed out a lot of people who already have significant injuries to the brain that affects their mobility by very, very simple tests. And this is uh, also eye dilation test. Um, it's a common, common, common deal. You guys do it mainly in phys physicals, but it's the same symptoms that a concussion would have for a person with traumatic brain injury. But it's by going over these very basics of the test, you can eliminate and eradicate several individuals that have received some sort of injury that does affect it. The NFL is in the entertainment industry. We are looking for eyeballs on the television. That's what we do. We want to get viewership. Are any of the proposals that you are recommending going to cause any more delays in the games, any more assessments in the games, keep key players off of the field so that people who are watching are not seeing the players that they came that they that they turned on the set to watch. Is it going to slow the process such that we are going to lose viewership? And if so, what's going to be the financial impact to us if we do lose viewership? The items that we've recommended wouldn't take the player out of the game. In fact, you already have the rule to take them out of the game. What we are recommending is that independent review to publicly show that there is not a conflict of interest when you're releasing these players medically. So will it already affect the game and the breaks it has? Not in the least. It will, however, affect the medical treatment after a game a player may receive. Could this affect a future game? Well, if the player received a concussion, just like now, and the physicians agree, he's out of the next game anyways. 
This will allow the independent third party to acknowledge that team's physician is correct in his diagnosis or assessment that he can return to the game. Also, like Brandon said, you know, um, if the players are treated appropriately, you can extend the life and for them playing for the league for longer. So say children have their favorite players in the field. They suffer a traumatic brain injury, they don't get diagnosed, and then you cut their, their life and the NFL short. They lose that fan base that whoever their uh, children looked up to that player. I mean, you lose them. So you retain them for longer years, say, if you treat them. Also, the recovery period from a concussion is actually relatively short because usually games are one uh, one week later, and even a couple hours of just rest makes a huge difference in the long term effects yeah. of TBI. It has been proven in medical studies with, with a concussion. Remember, not all concussion is necessarily a traumatic brain injury, but a repetitive concussion over a fresh injury will lead to traumatic brain injury. So just enforcing that that rest and downtime and having an independent physician say yay or nay. I mean, right there, you're actually limiting the permanent damage to this player and making sure that they can get back on the field and play more games, more seasons, and be a better player. In fact, if that star player is taken out for that one game, sure, he's out for that one game. You've already got those viewers watching the TV. They're going to sit and watch the game already. But that ensures that that player can get back a week later instead of receiving multiple hits and being gone, and then you lose your star player altogether. And then you have a season without a star player, your season can go down too. Ben Eisen, I don't have one question. You, you said you had a son. Yes. You don't allow him to play football. Uh, he's one right now, so he's here. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, it was a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> Very good choice at that age. So at this time, what what recommendation, what, what one recommendation, if we took it from you and made that decision today, would change your mind? you would then want to allow your son to play? Uh, proper tra uh, training, especially through the Heads Up program, and encouraging uh, coaches to prop know how to properly fit helmets would probably be the primary. Uh, most TBI in children is because these helmets, they're generic. I mean, I don't know how many of you have children, but they go through shoes like crazy. It seems like every couple weeks you have to get a new pair. Uh, making sure that those helmets are fitted properly uh, so that the chance of TBI is reduced. Uh, also, not letting the kids play uh, when they receive a hard hit or a concussion. If the schools and coaches can be trained, which the Heads Up program, uh, that under our recommendations, there would be more training at the coaches level how to recognize when a concussion has occurred and to take that child out of the game. And also, if uh, I, I was actually not educated on this until we started studying this, uh, I did not realize the effects of TBI. And uh, if the NFL would educate all people you know, through their games and get it to be common knowledge, what TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury is, and how a couple days of rest can actually make an emphasis. As a parent, I would feel like the NFL has been proactive and encouraged education so that my child, I, would, I as a parent would know what to do when my child received a concussion and to not let them play until you know I went to a doctor and had them checked out. So the fact that you had more information or education, although it didn't change the fact that the risk of the brain injury was still there. That would change your mind and allow you to accept that risk. Because I, as a parent, would know how to react to my child with that proper education if a brain injury occurred. You know, and, and the Heads Up program is it's looking at what can you do to prevent it from happening on the field. So it's teaching these little league coaches, and it does. It disseminates that information. It teaches them and says, hey, this is how you diagnose a concussion. This is how you keep it safe. So it does really create a better feeling that the NFL cares about everybody, about people watching, about people who play. That's a, that's a great feeling. People want a company, they want an organization that cares about them and their family. That's how you can take viewers and increase it. Is there any uh, closing question or information that any of the board would like to pose to the team here before we go into the feedback? <laughs> I you said I'm selling my team. <laughs> <laughs> well, sell for profit. You are the coach for this. All right. But at this point, we'll take a few minutes to uh, offer some feedback. Um, Do you mind if I don't know the last one? No, no, no. Thank you. Um, 
Again, job well done. Lots of information. Awful lot of information. The one thing that I would suggest in terms of style is a little more interaction from the rest of the team. Uh, it appeared that uh, Brandon was uh, was leading, which is okay to have someone to lead, but um, at, at, at times I kind of forgot that we all were there. You know, and, uh, and I think that it would be a little more effective to have more interaction from the rest of the team. That's it. That's it. It's funny because my first comment was going to be that I really liked the interaction. Like I, I think part of our problem here was because we don't have a remote, Brandon had to be out front. Yeah, so, I was so trying to lift my yeah, down yeah. Today. So, but but I but I liked the fact that it wasn't very, it wasn't rigid about who was presenting what. It was a there was a bit of a flow, and I thought that was uh, very good. Brandon, I've been thinking about getting my hair cut short, but I'm not going to now because I'm afraid I already look like a man. If I cut it shorter, I'll be. You said gentlemen I until the last. <laughs> until the end, you, you referred only to the gentlemen in the room. So I, you know, I wanted to point that out because I think it's important to gentlemen and ladies be aware of your audience. Yeah, but um, but I think you did a very good job of presenting the information and getting uh, bringing us up to speed. And uh, I actually saw this issue presented on last year at the business ethics competition in uh, at Loyola. And, uh, and one of the things that I think you did very well was position who we were, so that we were, uh, yeah, you know, uh, we, we all have some skin in this game. We all stand to lose a lot if this isn't dealt with once we know about it. So, you know, what, what did uh, they know and when did they know it is followed up in this case by what did they do about it. So uh, I think you presented very well on, uh, on all that. do get involved in this sport because of what they see on the uh, Sunday or Monday night football. That's why I play football. When I, when I used to play football, I got into it because I loved Herschel Walker. He was my hero. That's why I did it. And I got injured. So, it's a good job. Thank you. Um, very good. And uh, with um, being very clear about covering the information, um, what it is, how it's affected. <coughs> I also uh, would have liked to see a little bit more interaction with the presentation of the team. It is a team sport. <laughs> and uh, the one thing that my feedback would be, I felt it was very heavy on the financial. And uh, even though one of your points was about the appearance of the conflict of interest and these things, it still seemed to be it was because it was all about the financial bottom line. And from the ethical part of it and doing the right thing, I would have liked to have seen more emphasis of why we are the role model and why, how many lives would this affect if we took the lead and educated more people? Because, you know, it's the bottom line, we all you covered very well. But what would be the human impact of doing the right thing? How many of those kids that you showed, you know, would die? You know, those types of things.
not using a microphone, to take advantage of the fact that you can all stand up at front as opposed to just being one. Um, that would be helpful. Um, I thought that when you gave your presentation, one of the things that you did was toward the end, you mentioned the Heads Up program. But you said it's a good program, but then you didn't, the, even though we should know all about the detail of it, we don't. So to point that out in the presentation and not give more detail about it just in the Q&A would have been helpful because I would have liked to have seen what that is, a little bit more about the Heads Up program, what we're doing, and why is it only in New England? Is it because the owners are responsible for putting on the program in their own area? And is that something that can be negotiated with the NFL and the owners in order to be able to do that? And just, just some thoughts about the Heads Up program because it seemed like there was something that you really enjoyed or you really liked about the NFL, but at the same time, it wasn't something that, that was um, uh, given enough detail during the presentation. Um, a comparison with what's going on in other sports might also be helpful. A uh, recent, um, uh, recent situation where a race car driver pulled himself out of a race because of a concussion that he suffered in a prior race, that might be a good place to set. And then, um, and then also, there's a tie-in too with being the leader in the industry and setting the standard and the legal implications. I'm reminded of a, of a case that I read several years ago where a cyclist, a doctor, was out cycling. He got hit by a car and he suffered enormous brain damage. Um, and it was a, a complete loss. He, he lost his entire profession. They sued the helmet manufacturer because they said helmets for bicyclists do not cover the temple. It's a very important, and they lost. And the reason why is because the industry standard for bicycle helmets does not cover the temple. So I'm thinking to myself, the NFL is going to set the standard for the helmet. If they set the standard for the helmet and the child gets injured in peewee football, something like that, then what happens is the helmet manufacturers will be responsible for it because it didn't meet the minimum standards that the NFL set. So this, this point about making a better helmet that sets the standards so that when that standard is not met at the lower level, then that creates liabilities that can be insured against. That is another financial slash legal position that the NFL can take in the second higher stand. Which supports the ethical position of the leadership. Yeah, that's a good job. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought it was a pretty good presentation. I, I had some presentational points that I would suggest you consider. First of all, I think that you should lose the slide about Junior Seau because there's been no connection whatsoever between his 20 years of playing with CET and committing suicide. The two kids, I think they made a pretty close direct causal relationship yes. to the concussion and their death. And there still is discussion and debate as to whether Junior Seau had other problems or not. Now, if you're not going to answer that question, don't raise the question. Or just acknowledge that there's a debate. Or acknowledge that there's a debate. But maybe it's just better to take that part out. And, and along the same lines, uh, ben? Yes. ben made a comment. It takes only one court case. Think tobacco. One case like the hundreds. I would recommend you not say that. First of all, this is not dealing with a poisonous substance. Second of all, we don't care about whether there's one case or two cases or a thousand cases in an ethical decision, right? All that's saying is they never discovered it yet, right? So what you want to deal with are what happens after it's discovered and not kind of focus on that landslide of activity. To me, that was another uh, continuity of distraction. And, uh, the third one that concerned me was the slide regarding the statistics of head injuries. First thing I noticed, I happen to be a guy who looks at statistics, first thing I noticed is there wasn't a single direct
direct reference to a sports injury, let alone a football injury. Not one. The closest it came to was a 16% reference to striking an object. But they were talking about falls and other things like that. So the first question the skeptic would come up with is, well, people get hurt every day. And you're going to need to just differentiate between that, which you did not do. So if you're going to want to leave that slide in, I think it's going to be important to, again, acknowledge that sports injuries are like heightened aspects of each one of these pie segments, right? Falling down, getting struck, slip and fall, whatever it is, each one has a sports relationship. Address that or delete it. Um, and then finally, in my nitpicking, I think, Brandon, you did one thing that, that kind of bugged me a little bit. And that was, you are talking about the financial implications. And you showed a pre-point and a post-point, and then you said, you can do the math. I don't want to do the math. <laughs> okay? I can do the math, yeah. But I want you to do the math. So say, 30,000 minus 60,000, there's a the $30,000 net loss times 24,000 players, that equals this. Or don't say it at all. Um, so, it sounds like I didn't like your presentation. That's not true. As as I, I thought you did a really good job, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we will say thank you very much for your time and for the knowledge you have informed on that. I'm sure that we can learn a lot more from it. Uh, I wish you luck going forward.